Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce, and we are gathered together today with some people to talk all about what's going on with interest rates and inflation and everything, which is on top of mind for everybody. I would like to begin this day by acknowledging that I'm seating right now in the uh, ancestral unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking nations, the Songhees and the Esquimalt. So as we move through this today, we're going to cover a number of different topics and angles on what it is that we're all hearing and doing about inflation and interest rate conversations that are happening across the world, really. Joining us today are people who represent our cohort of chamber champions. Susan Mowbray is with MNP. She's a consulting partner. Chris Ewan is with RBC. He's an associate wealth and investment advisor. Jared Heemsoth is the director of capital markets with CIBC. Manny Deldago is with Island Savings. He's a senior wealth advisor. And Kevin Greenard is with Scotiabank, senior wealth advisor and portfolio manager. So I would imagine that every single day of your lives, you are hearing questions like the ones we're going to talk about today. But I just want to get a general sense of in day-to-day in -day business right now. And Susan Mowbray at MNP, I'll start with you. What are you hearing? What are clients? What are customers? What are people? What are your staff? What are other people around you saying about what's happening right now with our situation with inflation and interest? I think what we're hearing most is about what's happening in the labor market and what does that mean for what we should uh, we should be adjusting salaries and wages for staff are. We know that businesses are having a really hard time finding people. And so we're seeing wage growth and, you know, customers are asking and clients are, if we increase our wages, what do we do about our prices? And what, what does that mean for our clients and so on? So I think there's a lot of uncertainty. We haven't dealt with these levels of inflation uh, in recent memory. So I, th I think businesses are really on a learning curve. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chris, you in RBC land, what are you hearing from your folks? Yeah, we're hearing a fairly wide and uh, diverse set of concerns. When we look at today's environment, I mean, with the uh, uncertainty that Susan spoke about, I mean, uh, we're talking about rising costs of borrowing, we're inflation, increasing regular expenses. Uh, we're talking about uh, the potential for a recession uh, just around the horizon. Uh, but what we found is uh, the direct effect of rising interest rates, inflation and recession can be fairly unique to each individual household. So as a result, we're seeing uh, actually quite a quite a wide breadth of separate concerns. You know, do I still have sufficient retirement savings uh, to not let outlive my assets? Well, uh, or, you know, when I renew my mortgage, my costs are going to go up substantially. I may have a couple of rental properties. Does this affect the way I should position my finances? So we are seeing a, a very wide breadth of different uh, concerns. Thank you for that. Uh, Jared at CIBC, please yes. share what you're hearing. Well, the wonderful colleagues on the line definitely gave a, a really good overview. But but one thing that I will say, Bruce, is that we've actually what, what's interesting, and I'm sure everyone here on the panel will will echo what I'm about to say. But we've actually started these conversations with clients uh, 12 to 18 months ago. So if we actually turn the page back to 2021, um, it was around the spring when we really started to get a lot of conversations with our, our clients. And, and on, our, on our desk, we deal with a lot of companies. Um, that are hiring and, and they were telling us, look, like we, we have these job openings, we, we can't get workers. Um, and all of my unit costs that, that go into my production, whether it be, you know, some supply things overseas or, or, or selling goods, uh, let's say in Europe, they're taking so much time and they're costing a lot. Um, so we've been having these conversations since, since again, uh, a year ago. And and now we're still having those conversations, but I will say the one good thing, if there is a good thing uh, that's coming with this, is that conversations back then where we can't find workers, input costs are soaring, whereas opposed to now, it's we can't find workers, but input costs, at least some of the businesses are starting to see them come down a little bit. Um, so that's at least the one silver lining. Okay, Jared, thank you. Uh, Manny, Island Savings, what's going on in your world? What are you hearing? Yeah, so uh, a lot of great points have been brought up uh, by, by our other panelists. Um, I'll focus a little bit on our, on our local com business community here in Victoria and a lot of what we are uh, hearing about. Uh, Jared, Jared mentioned a lot of the concerns, which is increasing costs. Uh, Susan brought up a, a great point with very challenging environment for, uh, for labor. And so anecdotally hearing of postings that used to get dozens, if not hundreds of applicants now are just getting a handful and then the costs are, are increasing. So those are very real um, 
impact impactful scenarios that are that are uh, our business owners are facing or business owner members so very challenging environment right now thanks Mandy uh, and Kevin Greener Scotia Bank again what are you hearing what are you seeing yeah I think for the most part for our clients it's fo focused around cash flow and with inflation things costed a little bit more the conversation really focuses around like are you going to need additional cash flow for the year ahead most of our clients uh, that it impacts are mostly retired clients. And um, for the most part, they're not spending mo money because of COVID and related costs. Um, so they've been banking money over the years. So our team's pretty proactive. We've been sharing information with our clients about inflation, interest rates, adjusting asset mix accordingly. So it's um, we're not getting a lot of incoming calls directly relating to inflation. It's um, more kind of geopolitical risks and just kind of managing how best to position the investments in the portfolio for the current environment, not so much about inflation. And um, that's, yeah, I think over the years, we've worked with most of our clients for 15 years plus, and they've seen things like this in the early eighties and they realize that this too will pass. And, and um, yeah, it's just cash flow related primarily. And if they do need a little bit of extra, then we adjust the, the monthly withdrawal and our other clients that are working they're mostly medical and dental professionals and they're doing quite fine still so they're not as impacted as other kind of business owners out there so we're i think our group of clients are managing it fairly well you brought up the p word there which is political we're going to talk on that here for just a second yeah. too, shortly uh, but you all bring up some really interesting points the ones that are in the points of conversation all the time uh, labor certainly uh, supply chain people living on retirement funds and on retirement income, or those who are still trying to plan their retirement, what the impact this is gonna have, and in general, the cost of doing business. So without making this seem like a terribly obvious question, but I'm curious to get a response from all of you on when the central bank, when the Bank of Canada does what they do to slow down the economy, they raise interest rates. Chris, you and I'll start with you. Why do they do that? Uh, when we look at inflation as an economic phenomenon, uh, the price of goods go up over time. Central banks have a mandate to keep the inflation within a particular range. Usually the average is roughly about 2%. Um, on a year-over-year -year basis, it can fluctuate and deviate from that amount. Um, however, when things get out of control, there are steps that central banks need to take in order to bring inflation back down, particularly given the extraordinarily high rates that we currently have. One of the key tools of available to central banks to combat inflation over time is rising interest rates. Unfortunately, when interest rates go up, it's uh, almost effectively like putting the brakes on the economy. So there is fallout from that as well. When we look at some of the actions and the pace of the interest rate increases, it kind of puts the central banks in a little bit of a difficult position. Uh, rising the interest rates will help tame inflation, but at the same time put brakes on the economy. And thus, as a result, they're, they're, they're kind of in a little bit of a balancing act. They need to be able to raise rates quick enough to uh, avoid a protracted period of inflation, which is terrible for almost everybody. At the same time, they don't want to do it in a manner that will lead to a very substantial economic downturn. So looking at the tools available, uh, interest rates are just probably the most prominent tool that uh, uh, most Canadians are aware of for central banks to combat the currently high inflation. Okay, cool. Great answer. Jared Heimsoth at CIBC. Um, yes. Again, you, you explain this to people all the time. So let's get your perspective on, on this too. And the answer is to why do they do it? Of, of course. And I think Chris definitely gave a really great answer. And, and it's funny, Bruce, you, you asked this because um, my mother has a variable rate mortgage. And actually when she got her first, uh, it's open. So when she got her first uh, lift, lift off, she, she asked me, you know, what, why is this happening? So I actually have a recent memory of, of explaining it. And, and the way I like to think of it is, the, really the price of anything is, is a function of, of supply on one side and demand on the other side. And what's happening is that obviously um, prices are going up. And if you're the Bank of Canada and you're thinking, well, what can I do? How can we help cool prices? We know that Tiff Macklem and his team, they can't fix supply. He can't go and, you know, he can't go and, and create uh, new freights from, from Asia. He can't help with, with what's going on with fertilizer costs in Europe with the war. He can't do any of that. So the only thing the Bank of Canada can do is to try to lower demand. And Chris brought up a really good point because 
they're trying to lower demand without really lowering demand. Um, because uh, unfortunately, uh, the, 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 the slowdown in the economy is kind of a side effect of trying to come uh, kind of cool inflation. So again, really to summarize, what are they trying to do? They're trying to bring down prices and how are they trying to do that? They can't fix supply, so they have to bring down demand. Right, so Manny, when you answer the phone and say, hi, it's Manny at Island Savings. Somebody says, what are they doing? What's your answer? Yeah, I, I, uh, I reiterate a, a lot of the great comments brought up by, by Chris and, and by Jared, which is the, the primary tool that central banks have to slow down demand and, 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 and try and control inflation is the increase in, in interest rates. Uh, as was also brought up, it's a really fine needle that they're trying to, uh, to thread uh, because if rates go up too fast or too quickly, then they can actually tip the economy into a recession, which is not ideal. So that's the reason they're trying to, uh, they're using interest rates to, to try and, and taper inflation. But I think a really important point to bring up is that in, inflation can be um, like a self, self-fulfilling self prophecy. And so what the central banks really want to make sure is that they can remove the perception or the belief that inflation is gonna continue to, uh, to keep rising because that can have really, really dangerous effects on, on the economy and, uh, and uh, global, the global economy overall. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin Greenard, Scotiabank, come on in. Yeah, so I think they're really wanting a soft landing, which I, I don't know if the goal is to actually slow down the economy. They'd obviously like the economy to still plug along, but I guess with shutting down the economy for two years and, and um, with the pandemic, it just takes time to get things back on track again, which it will. And um, so I think the tools right now that they have available to them, I'm, I'm not overly concerned about kind of raising interest rates from these historic lows. I still think they're, they're still incredibly low. And um, so I think that the speed at which they're doing, I think as someone would have said a year ago, is the speed at which they're raising rates um, higher than what people were anticipating, I'd say yes. But so are inflation levels. and. I think the inflation levels are just higher, um, primarily because of geopolitical risks. We'll get back to that and, and other things that are restricting the supply. And so it's, um, I think that, that too will take time to sort out. And um, yeah, so. Okay, uh, and Susan Mowbray at MNP. Um, again, same sort of question. You, you work very extensively with business owners all the time. That's what MNP does. So what are you hearing from them and what's your explanation as to why the bank rate is going up? Well, one of the, and I, I think that uh, Manny made a really great point about, uh, you know, expectations, and that's um, what we, what we've seen as the, uh, as the economies reopened after the initial restrictions, is um, higher price growth year over year. I mean, inflation's measured in year over year growth. So initially during the pandemic, we had really low oil prices, and so some of that initial inflation we saw was just a measurement of year over year changes in oil prices. Um, but as things have progressed and, and as supply chains have started to unlock, we started to see inflation, inflationary expectations get set in. And there was there was some data that was released in um, sort of, I think it was mid-April or early May, where there was distinct differences in expectations about inflations from the general public versus from money managers and uh, people in the finance side. And that's when we saw central banks really start to move because they do not want to create an inflationary spiral. Um, on it. And so right now, the, uh, as Kevin said, the, we're not looking at, we, we've seen some significant interest rate hikes, but from a historical perspective, we still have relatively low interest rates. So from my perspective, I think that this is a good thing. It, it will help uh, stabilize the economy uh, as we come out of the pandemic and as supply chains continue to unlock. So I, for one, we, we've been telling our clients not to get too worried about inflation, just to sort of keep keep looking at uh, watching their labor uh, and making sure that they're competitive in the labor market and, and keep in mind that these inflationary expectations are gonna come down and we'll, we'll, we will return to those 2%, that sort of 2% expectation within that band. Eventually, it's just gonna take some time. Even though we've raised interest rates now, there is a lag before these kind of pol uh, policy tools could get. Yeah, so we're, we're actually recording this on August 11th. Yesterday was the day that the United States announced that inflation was starting to settle down a little bit. We're going to get the Canadian figures next week 
So by the time some of you are watching this, that will have already been spoken about. But all of you have touched on the challenges, if you will, that, that people are looking at in managing their money and their assets and their business uh, that have been created by this rise in inflation and in interest rates. But who will benefit from this? There has to be sort of two sides to the story. So uh, Jared Heemstoth at CIBC, I'll start with you. Who, who's going to benefit from this? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I mean, when when we think of who benefits, definitely there's going to be people who are going to benefit who have a lot of savings, who are not you know, really in debt, people who don't have you know leverage kind of up, up to their necks. Those people who have those savings, um, they're going to benefit with respect to, uh, we've been talking with, for example, our mortgage team here at CIBC, and there's been obviously quite one of the side effects of raising interest rates has been uh, a kind of vast slowing that we've been seeing in the housing market. So anyone who, again, has has those savings and is ready to make some sort of capital purchase that does not need to take up a lot of debt with these higher rates, um, they're probably going to be one of the, the benefits. But I will kind of conclude what I'm saying is that typically when interest rates go up, um, the purpose is to again to try to you know bring down the prices, and it's normally, unfortunately, that you have a bit of a squeeze on the general population. So it's going to be, uh, unfortunately, a little bit more people that are not going to be benefiting, kind of the opposite. But if I were to think of one of the um, uh, segments of the economy that's going to benefit, it's again people who are ready to make those those big purchases that don't need to borrow so much. Okay, thanks, Chair. I think I got your name wrong. It's Heimsoth. I said something else. But thank you for that. Heimsoth, yeah. Uh, right. Uh, Manny, that island savings, tell me about who you think is going to benefit from this. Yeah, so I think when looking at who will benefit, it's important to quantify whether it's going to be a long term inflationary period and trajectory. And in that case, it would be, you know, those uh, individuals or businesses that are able to have constant lower fixed cost and the ability to either increase the, 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 the revenue that they, that they generate or are able to pass it on to consumers. But in the short term, you know, individuals are starting to see a little bit of, uh, of uh, interest, meaningful interest in, in you know, term deposits, GICs, things like that. So even though um, on an inflation adjusted basis, they're still uh, not keeping up with inflation, at least the return is much better than it would have been even just 12 months ago. So um, I think it depends on, on the expectation of how long in inflation will stick around for, but those are uh, during a challenging time, a couple of scenarios where there could be some benefits. Okay, Kevin Greener at Scotiabank, benefits from your perspective. Yeah, so it's, it's an easy question. I, the wealthy will get wealthier for sure. And mm. um, there are the ones that will take this as an opportunity longer term with things pulling back price-wise in the financial markets, I'm talking specifically, they're the ones that have the risk tolerance and net worth to even buy more. Uh, they may have lost a little bit in this period, but they're gonna come out even wealthier um, in this period. Uh, that's kind of the cycle that always happens. And the, um, the people that don't have the net worth right now, they're the ones that are gonna struggle. Um, they're the ones that are probably even further behind. Um, they're the ones that, are, yeah, like even buying a house, for example, is going to be a little bit harder for them. And uh, but the wealthy, for sure, are just like every other period like this, they are going to get wealthier after this. Okay, Susan Mowbray, MNP. Uh, I would I would echo Kevin's comments. I think that some of the people in the short term that are going to be really hurt are people who recently purchased made significant purchases of housing uh, with large mortgages. This is going to hurt them, especially if they are in a variable rate situation. Uh, most. Um, and we're starting to hear a little bit about people being squeezed, some people being underwater because of the declines in prices. Uh, in some cases, people aren't able to close on their houses because the um, uh, the, uh, the appraisal is less than the, the value that uh, of the mortgage at this point. And so it's I think it's going to create additional problems in the housing market for those people trying to enter. Okay, we're going to move along for this. Anybody else want to add anything about the benefits to who will benefit from all of this? I think it might also be worth uh, adding here. This is uh, 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 Chris speaking. Um, mm -hmm. I think it might be worthwhile uh, uh, adding that uh, who might benefit the, I think the 
answer to that question can change depending on how the inflation and interest rate situation unfolds moving forward. Although in the current environment, there may be a subset of Canadians and, or businesses that may benefit, if we do see a protracted uh, uh, period of heightened inflation uh, requiring you know, uh, uh, many more uh, or a substantial further increase to the interest rate, uh, dragging down the rest of the economy, I think uh, if we re-experience another period like we experienced in the 70s and the 80s, um, I would almost say that uh, there, nobody will benefit in that type of scenario. Um, some will hurt more than others, but we will all hurt nonetheless. Great, thank you. Uh, we've talked about other periods in history where this sort of thing happened. I'm a guy, for example, who one time had, I believe it was a 19% mortgage because those days were around at one time. It's almost hard to believe, but that's how old I am. But people can recall that that was a time in history when that happened. So in the 70s and 80s, governments again had to take very forceful action to sort of stall the economy, um, to tame the rising costs and, and wages and that sort of thing. How does this circumstance differ from those times when that sort of activity had to happen? And Manny, I'll begin with you at Island Savings. Sure, so if we look back at the period in, in, in the 70s and early 80s, um, there, the, the one main difference is central banks now have a more focused mandate for price stability. So back in the 70s and 80s, there were conflicting mandates that central banks were trying to, 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 to juggle, and some of them had different um, impacts on, on, on the economy. So as a result, the delay that, the, you know, by the time they started increasing rates, it inflation had already gripped hold of, of the economy. So the, the, the outcome was that rates had to go up very, very high, very quickly, which led to a very significant deep recession. So that's why I think central banks all over the world are trying to be proactive and being very forceful in their comments initially to try and uh, be earlier rather than, than later. Thanks, Manny. Kevin, what do you think difference between back in the disco days and now? Well, similar to kind of the mortgage that you're talking about, I think 20% is quite a bit different than where we're at right now. And I think the numbers that we saw back then, the base was quite a bit lower um, from the starting point. It's kind of like the comment about oil and inflation numbers is a great point. It's like a year ago, oil was, I think, trading at 6 or $7 a barrel. And, and now we look at it where it's at today. Of course, the year-over-year -year numbers are going to be higher. So it's, um, yeah, I, I just, I think from the standpoint of this inflation level, it will stabilize again because... It takes 12 months for the inflation numbers to, to kind of stabilize. So I think the numbers are going to last for a little bit longer. The supply constraint will come back on and the inflation levels will drop back down. It will just take time and we're definitely going to get through this inflationary period too. It's, it's going to reset everything a little bit, but um, it's all relative. Wages will go up and, and um, it's just tougher for the, the younger people, but the wealthy are going to get wealthier. And when you say things are all relative to that mortgage I had that was, I think, at 19%, was, was $45,000 mortgage or something at the time. So it's kind of apples and oranges in a way. But Susan Mowbray, what do you think? I think one of the key differences between what's happening now and what happened in the 1970s and 80s is what's happening in the labor market. Um, and so in the 1970s and 1980s, part of what created the inflation was a, an injection of fiscal stimulus because we had oil price shocks that were causing high levels of unemployment. Right now, we have an overheated labor market. We do, we have shortages in the labor market. And so um, that, is, that is a big difference. So that as you uh, slow the economy and, and bring demand down, we should see a rebalancing in the labor market, which isn't, which if it rebalances and we have it right, won't lead to sort of a prolonged recession. Uh, the other factor is that we're starting to see some of this is supply chain, some of this is geopolitical, but we are starting to see gas prices come down. We're starting to see oil prices stabilize. We're starting to see things start to move. And as Kevin said, it does take some time to work through, but gas has now been, is now below $2 a liter, where for a while it was above $2 a liter. The uh, long-term forecast for the price of crude are coming down. We're seeing, uh, we've seen commodity prices start to decline a bit uh, on the agricultural side as Ukraine has started to be able to ship grain. So I think, I think we're see, seeing the signs that some of the pressures that have been building on the uh, supply side are starting to ease, which will be good for, for the, that long-term outlook. 
I mean, there is optimism embedded in everything we're talking about here today. So, so thank you for that, Susan. Chris, over to you at RBC. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, the 70s and 80s uh, uh, is a little bit of a, a sore point and a black mark on uh, the uh, fiscal and monetary policy. A series of absolutely terrible decisions uh, led to uh, uh, inflation running wildly out of control. Now, um, the prolonged period of missteps, I guess, more or less resulted in uh, uh, what was thought to, to not really be something that actually happens was a prolonged period of both high unemployment and high inflation. And that actually led the central banks into, uh, 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 um, uh, into a very difficult position to try to combat it. Well, on one, to fight inflation, once again, raising interest rates is one of the key tools available to fight inflation, but that slows down the economy and, again, negatively affects the already high unemployment rates. By contrast, addressing the unemployment issue uh, will result in further inflation. So that really puts central banks between a rock and a hard place. Um, you know, you, you try to fight one more and you're going to lose a second, you fight the second, you're going to lose the first. And I think that's one of the reasons why inflation was so entrenched and uh, so prolonged during that period. Um, it was almost structural into the way things worked at that time. By contrast, uh, as my colleagues here have talked about today, um, some of the factors leading to inflation today, you know, uh, supply chain disruptions caused during the pandemic, we have the shock to energy prices as a result of the Ukrainian war, um, we have massive amounts of liquidity injected in the economy uh, over the past couple of years, uh, including direct payments to households, um, people weren't spending quite as much and household savings were at record highs, and of course the pent up demand from being stuck at home for two years. Um, now, uh, although these aren't great, it is, I am optimistic to see that many of these factors are temporary in nature. We don't expect the Ukrainian war to affect energy prices for the next decade. We don't expect household savings rates to stay where they are for the next decade. Um, the, the liquidity injections and direct payments to households has slowed down or stopped depending on the economy that you're looking at. Now, that being said, Said, despite the position we're in right now still being somewhat precarious, I do see that we are in a far better uh, position than we were about four decades ago. Optimism. We like the optimism we're hearing here in these comments today, too. <laughs> Thank you for that, Chris and Jared. CIBC, over to you. Yes, it's uh, certainly hard going last on this panel because there's so, so, so many good points. It's just almost like you're sound, like I, I almost would be sounding like a broken record. But um, the, only, the only other thing that, that I would add is... Um, and I think someone, I forget who, I think someone mentioned this, is keep in mind who is in charge of the central banks now. If we go back to the 70s with, with Burns and Miller uh, running the Fed, they made some pretty big tactical errors in terms of their approach to inflation. And it wasn't really until Mr. Paul Volcker came out and, and took rates from here to there over, over the course of breakfast that things really start to come down. And Jerome Powell, who, who's running the Federal Reserve, he says that, you know, vocal, vo, uh, Paul Volcker is, is my idol. And their approach, at least what they're trying to do, is they're trying to be what we call being very hawkish, try to get ahead uh, and, and definitely try not to make the mistakes that were made in the 70s. Um, so that's really the only other thing. And, and what I will say is it, it would be very, very unlikely for us to see inflation not coming down. And, and like you said very accurately, Bruce, um, yesterday as this recording and, and also this morning with the producer prices, we already are starting to see prices come down or at least moderate um, and we're only at, only at kind of a two and a half percent inflation rate. So there are very, very different economies. And for anyone worried that they're hearing in the media that yes, inflation is at 1980s highs, um, I think it's going to be soothing to hear like it's a completely different ball game and we should have inflation under control, uh, if not now by probably the end of the summer. Okay, thank you all for that. Uh, we got some input into this from uh, some people in the general business community. Um, someone is asking what this panel, what you folks think will happen to wages in the business community as a result of inflation. Uh, in some cases, wages are heavily regulated by collective agreements, right, through, through labor agreements and union contracts, some of them within government by the Ministry of Finance rules. So if the private sector pays more to offset the pressures of inflation for their employees, what's the domino effect in the public sector and vice versa? Yeah, no, that's a really, really good question because this is a, a transitory period where we've seen really significant wage growth. We are seeing significant wage growth. 
uh, just in terms of um, not just from inflation, but just because we do have shortages. So uh, how do you solve a shortage of labor? You pay more in a lot of cases. Uh, in, the, in the situation of government, they're in a really tough position because they're in the process of renegotiating collective agreements. And they don't really have a good window right now on what inflation will be. Uh, two years from now. We know what we expect it to be and it'll come back down, but is that what it's going to be? So they're getting a lot of pressure. So I do not envy being in that position. With respect to the um, government versus private sector, I, I think that wages are only one thing that people look at when you're looking at uh, the the compensation package and government has a lot of other levers, such as their pension. Uh, that's an important uh, part of the compensation in government. So um, I, I think that that's a consideration. The other thing is, if you look at employment data, we've seen significant growth in government positions relative to the private sector over the last few years. So I, I think government's probably in a pretty good position. But as I say, I wouldn't want to be trying to negotiate their collective agreements right now myself. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that. Um, if anybody else doesn't want, uh, wants to make a comment, please do so. But if not, I'll move along to another, another point here. Anybody want to say? No, we're good. Okay, so here's one. Uh, I'm on a committee with the Canadian Chamber that's finalizing the, the um, policy proposals that will go forward at the Canadian Chamber AGM. These are the policy proposals that will be taken to the federal government to enact legislation or activity of some kind. One of the things that's come up in that is the idea of extending the amortization period on mortgages, right? Maximum right now in most cases is 25 years. What about a 30 year? What about a 35? What about a 40 year amortization for a mortgage? Does that mean that people are going to be able to afford houses again based on those lower payments? Or will it just continue to accelerate debt? And uh, Kevin, do you want to take a shot at that one first? Increasing amortization? Yeah, I'm, I'm really on the, with banks, we you're normally on the investment side or the lending side. And um, again, that's a lending type question. And I know the, the banks have certainly done quite a, or central banks and the banking environment as a whole, they've done quite a few steps over the last kind of since 2000 or the credit crisis, really 2009, we saw lots of different changes to change the ratios on what people qualify for. I've read that just like everyone else, but I'm not specifically in the role that, that um, kind of deals with that. So one of these other experts that deal with lending could maybe answer that okay. one for you. Okay, Manny, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, sure. Yeah, that's that's certainly something that's top of mind as uh, interest rates uh, continue to climb and uh, mortgage aff affordability will is is affected by that. Um, I'm not sure what secondary effects it would have, uh, and what I mean is in periods in recent times when mortgages have been more affordable. In that case, it was because rates were so low. Um, it didn't necessarily help with uh, affordability, but what it did is also drive up housing costs and ho housing prices to uh, pretty pretty rapidly. So um, I know it's it's possible to extend mortgages in certain certain uh, certain circumstances right now, especially if you're renewing a mortgage and 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 uh, and, and qualify uh, under under certain rules. Uh, but I'm not sure if if the goal is to uh, help with affordability in the housing sector, I don't know if extending the mortgages would be something that would um, that would be the, the way to go. Okay, Jared, are you hearing anything about this? Yeah, we actually. This is a re really good question. We we have been hearing some some rumors, but what I will say, and this is to kind of elaborate on what what Manny said. Um, in Canada, obviously, you know, 25 year amortization is is kind of the gold standard with a five year fix. And our, our neighbors down south, actually, a lot of them have 30 year mortgages. And, and in fact, a lot of them also have 30 year fixed mortgages as well. So it's quite a different market. And we have actually heard in, in, in a lot of countries in Europe, um, they've been flirting with the idea of 35 uh, or up to 40 year amortization. But what I will say is I think the policymakers kind of have to tread a little bit lightly on that because um, if we go to a world where all of a sudden everyone goes from 25 to, to 40 year, um, essentially you're just encouraging people to kind of take on more leverage and a longer time period. And I really don't think that that's going to actually help with affordability at all. And I think if policymakers um, want to tackle that supply demand and balance, um, instead of trying to help the demand side, I think, and we've actually published this recently, um, 
we really need to help with the supply side and anything that they can do to help in, encourage builders to build, encourage more units to go up, um, that's probably going to have a lot better impact on affordability um, than all of a sudden saying, okay, now everyone can qualify at a 40 year AM because if everyone who you're competing with can qualify at, at a longer AM, um, you're probably just going to end up with prices almost going up. And again, more, more people taking on debt for a longer period of time, which I don't think the CMHC is, is going to want. That's Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation. Uh, Chris at RBC, I know you're a wealth management guy, but this is about managing your money in and your money out. So what about this longer amortization? What do you think? Absolutely. I'll expand on a couple of the points uh, my colleagues here have uh, touched on. Uh, but from the from from the perspective of the buyer, of the Canadian family, um, the longer amortization isn't necessarily always a great thing. And just to provide a little bit of clarity, although the Canadian average or the gold standard is typically the 25-year amortization, I believe Canada allows financial institutions to issue mortgages up to 35 years. Now, if memory serves correct, I had a conversation about this with another client about a week or two ago, but I believe it used to be 40 years before they reduced it to 35 as the maximum after 2008. Now, I have also heard uh, uh, a couple of conversations around, well, perhaps uh, extending it back out to 40 years may make housing a little bit uh, uh, more affordable. And on the surface level at the beginning, I think that absolutely makes sense. Um, we qualify for a mortgage based off of uh, our incomes and our expenses, and a longer amortization on a mortgage reduces our monthly mortgage costs. Uh, but one other factor that uh, actually comes into play that uh, uh, a lot of home buyers don't, uh, or ha at least haven't looked at very closely over the last couple of years as a result of ultra low mortgage prices is the total lifetime interest cost. Now, uh, from some of the numbers that I ran uh, uh, several weeks ago, uh, we'll use a, a $1 million mortgage and a million dollars in Victoria at this point in time, uh, that actually doesn't get you a whole lot um, if you're looking for a freehold property. But uh, current mortgage prices for a five-year fix is roughly about 5.5%. If we look at the total lifetime uh, interest paid to the mortgage issuer for a 25-year versus a 35-year mortgage, over a 25-year mortgage, I believe the total lifetime interest cost is a little over $800,000 on a $1 million mortgage. If we extend that exact same mortgage out, $1 million mortgage, 5.5% uh, over 35 years instead of 25 years, that number in total interest cost bumps up from about a little over 800 to a little over $1.2 million. At this point, we've substantially exceeded what the initial amount already is is. That difference, uh, roughly about $400,000, represents nearly a 50% increase to interest costs paid. If we further extend that limit from 35 to 40 years, it'll exacerbate that difference. And I believe Manny touched on it uh, just now as well. Well, if we, if we address the mortgage affordability from the purchasing power perspective, without touching on the supply side, all we're going to do is we're, we're, we're going to increase demand by increasing purchasing power. If we don't uh, uh, manage the supply side as well, um, we're, we're just going to have housing prices increase to match what that higher demand is going to be. So uh, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not confident that uh, increasing the mortgage amortization would have any any or too many positive outcomes well the lender makes more money in the long run i guess is what you could say exactly. about that right <laughs> uh, susan anything you'd like to add I, I don't have anything to add i think yeah, my colleagues have covered it quite well okay. we also had a specific question asked about uh, the impact that inflation is having on construction cost instruction construction investment we've been touching on housing in a number of different ways here so the demand for housing of course is still very high right now but there are some developers that I've heard of that are starting to slow down right now because they are having a problem with inflation, with interest, even with supply chain. And I'm just interested to know in general, Chris, I'll start with you at CIBC, what you're hearing around that. Sorry. Um, as it relates to uh, uh, construction, um, now I'm not a real estate expert, but uh, uh, from my perspective, I would assume that a lot of the macro concerns, including rising interest rates and inflation, will factor into the decision making process for a lot of these developers and builders. I mean, if nothing else, during that development process, higher interest rates will lead to higher cost of construction loans, um, higher cost of takeout mortgages. This increases the total cost of build and reduces uh, the ultimate investor return. 
term. Um, they're also operating in a very challenging labor market, particularly in trades uh, uh, um, almost all across uh, uh, Canada. And then combined with uh, uh, rising interest rates, increasing mortgage costs, that'll likely reduce the demand as well. When we look at the confluence of all of these factors, um, you know, there are, I think it's probably going to be facing more headwinds now than there were before. Now, that being said, um, there is an incredible amount of highly stable demand for Vancouver Island property. And given uh, uh, where that demand supply uh, uh, imbalance currently sits, uh, my suspicions are that we probably need several more years of uh, record new development starts before we begin to even find where that equilibrium is. And I think in the meanwhile, um, the, 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 the local uh, uh, construction and development uh, uh, industry will remain strong. Okay, thanks. Jared, what are you hearing about this? Yeah, so we, we actually speak with, uh, I don't work in the real estate team, but we actually have a colleague who used to work there. Um, and, and the good news is that locally, the, the developers have been um, continuing to build, which, which is great. But what we have heard, though, in, in Toronto and actually out east in Canada, is a lot of developers have actually put a lot of projects on hold. Um, now, that is not a good thing for, for the consumer looking to buy, because if you have new supply that's supposed to come up, not get put up because of the uncertainty, that's not going to help fix the, the supply issue that we have in this country. So um, yes, this is definitely, uh, developers are, are definitely watching rates, they're definitely watching you know, the housing market, they, def they don't want to be overexposed to building too much. Um, but the good news again here locally in BC is that um, a lot of the developers continue to build and, and to uh, echo what Chris said and, and maybe to re-echo it seven more times is they need to build and they need to build a lot. Um, and again, we, we really, I think as, as, a, as a team here in BC, I think the more we can encourage more units to get built, more units to get built, um, that's only going to help uh, the average Canadian you know, to afford a house because face it, everyone wants to move to BC. You know, we, you go overseas, everybody loves Canada, everybody loves BC. So the demand is always going to be there. Um, we just have to make sure that we can keep up on the supply side. Okay, so let's wrap this up here with a little bit of uh, gazing into the crystal ball. We've heard some reference earlier to the usual rate of inflation, which is around 2% that everybody sort of anticipates as being quote unquote normal. Mm -hmm. um, when will we get back to that, do you think? When is that going to possibly happen, Susan, for us to get back to 2% from where we are now? Um, I think I would expect sometime in 2024, 2025, that we'll, we'll see the interest or sorry, the uh, inflation rate stabilize. It does take time for these things to work through the, uh, the system. Okay. Uh, Chris, you and RBC, what do you think? Um, I will almost exactly echo what Susan indicated as well. Um, as these things can take some time, um, I think the odds of seeing it in 2023 are very slim. Seeing it back down to the two, two, two and a half percent level, I think it'll take at least about three years. Okay. Jared, the CIBC crystal ball, what have you got to say? Yeah, we don't have an official forecast, but I, I think probably end of 2024. I mean, we have to remember that uh, within the CPI, which is the consumer price in this bundle where they throw all the, the goods in and measure inflation, um, we're going to probably go from eight to five pretty quickly or eight to six pretty quickly because a lot of that is gasoline. Um, mm. But the left, the, what's left in that bundle, what we call that are stickier items that take a little bit longer to come down, such as rent costs uh, and housing and, and food prices as well. Um, that's probably going to take some time. So I, I hate to agree with, with everyone because it's nice to have a healthy debate, but I'm going to probably say the, the, the second half of 2024. Everybody's so equally clever here. That's what it is. Manny, you were nodding your head too, right? Yeah, that's the, the consensus is that inflation is going to start to moderate this year and it already may have uh, began after yesterday's uh, release down south. Uh, but for inflation to remain above 2%, through throughout 2023 so into, into 2024 uh, that seems to be the the, the consensus and kevin your clients and all you're you're directing them in that same thought direction yeah obviously we're all doing our best estimates and i think we're talking months not multiple years type thing and i keep going like i think the the comment about oil and how low that was 
a year ago is crazy low, lowest point in all the years I've been doing this. And so that's one of the components of CPI. And when you see that change as drastically as it did, the, um, that's kind of been a big part of, of what's happened with the inflation numbers being so high. So I think yesterday it peaked, uh, the, or the June numbers peaked. And yesterday we saw how that's starting to go down. And, and um, yeah, I think you could almost track where oil prices when they started to recover and um, look kind of 12 months from that point, because it's always year over year numbers. And there's obviously some supply cons constraints that need to work them themselves through. The economy was shut down for, for two years, roughly. And so if we kind of mirror that somewhere in between oil prices, getting the economy back going again, somewhere in that range. But I wouldn't say multiple years. That's, that, that would be outside what I would estimate. Well, I think that's going to end all of this on a pretty high note with some optimism. So thank you all for your perspective and time today. Uh, Kevin Greenard is with Scotiabank. He's a senior wealth advisor and portfolio manager. Manny Del Dago is with Island Savings, senior wealth advisor. Jared Heimsoth is with CIBC, director of capital markets. Chris Ewan, RBC, associate wealth and investment advisor. And Susan Mowbray with MNP as a consulting partner. Thank you all for your advice and for your time. Enjoy the ride that we're on together right now. And we'll see you all again soon. And thank you all very much. Any feedback you have on this, you're more than welcome to contact us at the Greater Victoria Chamber. If you want to call, contact me directly, I am CEO at victoriachamber.ca. On behalf of all of us, thanks for watching.